Welcome everybody. We're really glad to have everyone here. This is the last of our uh, housing webinars, tackling housing needs in small towns. We're really excited to see you all here. We've got about 100 people registered, a little over 100. So um, we'll probably have more joining us. And we are recording this session, so we will share it with people as um, we'll share it with our list of people that are registered and we'll share all the resources as well. So just to get started, um, my name is Tara Mastel and I'm happy to be here with you all today. And I have my co-host Kaya Peterson from NeighborWorks Montana. And this is the last of our four webinar series. Today we're talking about, we have, um, Three different speakers today that are going to share with you stories of things that have happened in their small towns based on um, some initiative that they have taken kind of coming out of this webinar series and based on topics that we know that are very much of interest with you with the group. So, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Tara Mastel and I work for Montana State University Extension. And I am the program leader for our community vitality program, also known as community development. So we focus on rural community vitality all across the state. We manage the program called Reimagining Rural. We also spend a fair amount of time working on helping um, improve the skills of our local leaders through our Big Sky Being Leadership program. So um, I'm, I'm based out of Bozeman, but I, I, I work remotely from Red Lodge. This series, this webinar series, it's a, we had a series of four topics and it was really designed for leaders like yourself, rural leaders living all across the state, people that are um, volunteers, they aren't necessarily housing experts. We designed this webinar series to help you all solve the problems that you are seeing in your communities. We heard a lot of people around the state just really having these urgent challenges with housing and but they're not housing experts and in rural communities we just don't have those local um, housing experts typically our housing experts are on a regional basis or on a statewide basis so we wanted to help folks be able to figure out what's the first step that they can do in their town to take advantage of of what opportunities they have there to improve their housing situation and and then find out who they can call for the next help their next um the next call for help um, in our first webinar series, we talked, and all of these are, are on our website, and you can watch the recordings. Our first webinar, we shared about how to get organized because not everybody um, has that housing expert. So, um, and we really emphasized in that one, taking advantage of your local opportunities, and you'll see that today, that theme of what is your what opportunities do you have and getting organized together as a community just community volunteers even um, helps you find out what your opportunities are um kaya do you want to introduce yourself and then maybe do you want to introduce our first speaker great hello everyone kaya peterson i'm the executive director of neighborworks montana we're a statewide organization that's been working on housing affordability for 25 years and just been really great working with Tara and MSU Extension on this webinar series and on um, support and outreach with many of you and your rural communities on this complicated but critical issue. So as Tara said, we have a great group of practitioners, people in local communities who are taking steps to find solutions to housing needs in their communities. And we're gonna start with, um, Katie Biggs, and Katie, I'm going to have you introduce um, the work that you're doing in Fort Benton, and um, we're going to start with the, some, some work that's happening there. Thanks, Kaya. And I am Katie Biggs. I'm the Director of Operations at Naval Works Montana, so I get to work with Kaya every day, and it has been so much fun to see these reimagining rural um, just conversations we've been having. Um, and I get today to share the screen with Ross Reddig. Ross is a community member in Fort Benton, Montana, and I will let him introduce himself. Ross, why don't you start off us off with how you came to call NeighborWorks Montana over a year ago, how you got connected with me, and kind of what the landscape in Fort Benton was a year ago. Let's start there, and then we'll dig into more of what we've done. 
Okay. Uh, so, yes, about a year ago, I was appointed to the city county planning board here in Fort Benton. And uh, as the newbie, uh, of course, I had a little bit of a learning curve, but we were in the process. Uh, we were supposed to update our growth policy in 2020, but because of COVID, that got pushed off a little bit. Um, and so we started that process. And of course, what immediately presented itself to us as the main future need was housing. And uh, uh, Katie joined our city county planning board meeting uh, on a conference call. And so we she we became aware of some of the things that NeighborWorks Montana was doing um, and then reached out to her for a little bit of help on just where to start with housing. Uh, we, we've had a little glitch in getting our uh, our growth policy completed as well, but that's kind of a separate story because we're going ahead with uh, taking a look at housing needs. Um, so, uh, Katie helped us, uh, we put together a survey and, uh, we are almost done with that process. I guess we've had a few surveys come in to Katie that have not yet been collated, but she's going to share some of the results of that survey with you in a bit. Um, so uh, obviously we just have to try to get a handle on, uh, existing needs. Uh, we're a community of about 1,400 here in Fort Benton, but uh, we've been fortunate that we've had some growth recently. Uh, uh, business moved into town. Um, our hospital and clinic have been growing. Schools have been growing a little bit. So we need help for the new teachers, new nurses, new uh, new workers that are moving uh, into town and we're starting with the survey and then we're going to learn where we go from there. Yeah, so when Ross and his crew had me come up, they, um, the group had a, a varying ideas of what needed to, to solve what they needed to solve to fix the problems that they had before them. And they had engaged Great West Engineering on a few different things, community needs studies, but not entirely sure where exactly to go. They had some, um, ideas in mind, some theories that one of their big issues um, and prohib prohibitors to growth was in fact their housing situation. And I said, okay, well, anecdotally, you guys know that, but let's see if we can confirm that with employees across um, your community. So they have, like Russ said, their school system, they have a health system, um, they just had a large head plant come in, and they've got a few other local downtown businesses. So we shared a survey with those folks, and I'm gonna share that with you guys. We'll go through it pretty quick so we don't take up all the time, but you should be able to see my screen. So these are some of our results. Um, just also to note for those of you that are not in North Central Montana, Fort Benton is about 45 minutes from Great Falls. So um, we were wondering, you know, how many of these folks are living in Great Falls where it's more affordable for them and commuting. So we kind of looked at um, how satisfied folks were with their living situation. Most people we found to be very satisfied. Um, we didn't find quite as many people living far away um, as we supposed. We Most of the people are living kind of in the downtown core of Fort Benton. And those that do live out of town are due to um, spouses working in different communities, um, unavailable affordability, and choice. There's a lot of farmland around Fort Benton. So, um, some folks that were working at these businesses that these employers distributed the surveys lived out of town because of um, family farm. We did have, as we often see, kind of one naysayer about the survey with um, no desire for affordability and um, no desire to see new construction happen in Fort Benton. So, you know, as we all often see and familiar with this work, that that happened. Um, we didn't have those folks that were living out of Fort Benton can, that would consider moving to Fort Benton should something come available that was affordable. Um, most of the folks felt like their um, current housing met their needs in this moment um, and slightly less felt that their housing would meet their need in the next five years. Um, Ross and his group kind of confirmed that there are some um, rundown properties that could use rehab, and so that's one direction we'll look at going. Is what does that what does that look like to rehab properties in their downtown core? Um, there, 
were people that a few people that had um, housing that was not permanent. And in the narrative questions, we found that there were some folks that were living there, living in basements, living with family members, things like that, because they couldn't afford either the rent, couldn't afford or could not find supply wise the rent um, or ability to purchase a home in Fort Benton. So there were some that did not have um, permanent housing at this time. Um, there were folks that believed that their home was in need of major improvements to remain livable. And there were a few folks that believed they could not stay in Fort Benton um, if they could not find decent affordable housing. One of the comments on that was we had a, I'm assuming a young couple that were both teachers in Fort Benton and they said, we cannot both teach here if we can't find a place to live here. So we're seeing folks like that be heavily affected by the lack of housing. Uh, most folks felt that the supply of available housing was a significant impactor on people's ability to stay in Fort Benton. Um, Ross and his crew had also indicated to me that several properties in their downtown core had switched over to an Airbnb or short-term rental style because they didn't want to did not want to mess with long-term renters. Also, that section of Fort Benton's right on the river and a great place to access fishing and into the Missouri River breaks and outdoor stuff. So um, they were seeing a conversion of solid properties going to uh, short term rentals. Uh, the folks or many people that filled out the survey also felt that the quality of the available housing um, was a significant impact and that would affirm what Ross and the county planning board felt as well that there was um, some blight, some rundown properties. And that also cost was a significant issue. Um, we also um, asked how they ended up living in their current situation. Most had bought through realtors. Um, several had found out that you know their their home that they own now was coming for sale from a friend. So we're seeing things in Fort Benton not even hit the main market because people are kind of back end coming in and buying these houses because of the connections they have. So that's really affecting those folks that are trying to kind of relocate or move out of rentals in Fort Benton area. We all found are also found that there's people living with families, there's people living in basements. Um, those kind of scenarios were happening, people living in Great Falls, commuting to Fort Benton because rental properties were too hard to come by in Fort Benton. So overall, our um, idea that there is a disconnect between available and affordable units and the ability for workers to find homes was confirmed through the survey work that we did. We did ask a brief question about whether or not folks had been at risk of foreclosure or losing their home to eviction. Uh, we did have four responses of yes out of the 30 plus that we did fill out the survey. Uh, there's a lot of similarity when we asked what types of housing, if any, would um, they like to see in Fort Benton. The county planning board imagined that, you know, some fourplexes, um, potentially some small eightplexes, um, maybe a townhome style would really be um, a difference maker in this community. And that was affirmed by the folks that are living in the community and working in the community. Uh, we're not talking large numbers here. We're talking just, you know, maybe even 10 to 15 units of housing come in that would support changing the overall issue. Um, most folks felt that kind of um, everywhere from the two to three bedroom homes to a small apartment would be something that would be very um, impactful in Fort Benton. Um, we did ask kind of desires or goals uh, for your housing situation in the future. We won't touch on those today, but if you do want me to send out the survey so you guys can see what we did um, and spend more time with it because I'm going through very quickly, uh, that would be totally doable. Um, most of the folks that filled out the survey were in that 45 to 54 age range. Um, this then indicates kind of some of the workforce space in Fort Benton because this was distributed via the large employers in the city. Um, and most folks had at least two to three living in their home. Um, we did see, again, a significant number of that 45 to 54 in terms of people living in each home. Um, we didn't see quite as many children living in Fort Benton, not overly surprised by that. It has kind of been more of a, um, a retirement community, but there is some good families with that 13 to 18 year old age range in there. We see kind of um, less numbers in that 19 to 34 age range. And so that's where we found um, the people living in the home. Most folks were spending between $651 and $1,250 a month on their housing expenses. Uh, obviously some were over that, some were under that. Um, but that was kind of the average uh, expense that people were spending in Fort Benton. Um, 
we saw some trading for calves for rental payments. <laughs> so calving and cow work for um, rental payments. Um, and then we saw, you know, people living generationally with families. Um, most people felt overwhelmingly that this was needed, that the work um, to, to increase the housing supply in Fort Benton was needed and that this was something that needed to happen in Fort Benton to continue the workforce development so that the community didn't go backwards because they really have experienced growth. It's a beautiful community. Um, so from there, last week I got, or two weeks ago, I got to go to Fort Benton and with Great West Engineering, we sat down with the County Planning Board. We sat down with a whole group of folks that were um, interested in this and we started saying, okay, now what? What comes next? And again, there's still dissension and different theories and different methods to where um, the groups within that, that county planning board want to go with this. But one of the biggest things that we found was that housing needs to be at the top of the conversation. Great West Engineering really encouraged Ross and his folks to um, look at pursuing a full community needs assessment, a 10-year plan, and um, a, a direction with an engineering firm like them, like themselves, to go forth and figure out then, okay, if we're gonna support this growth because they're running into issues of infrastructure and expansion and they've got the river and they've got floodplains and they've got all of these things, if they're really gonna support long-term growth, we have established that housing is an issue. We've established that there will be bodies that will fill those homes, but what does that look like um, on a practical application going forward? Um, and Ross, I was, you know, obviously Great West Engineering and I exited the conversation after we presented what kind of solutions did you guys, or where did you leave it after that meeting on February 8th? Can you share where you guys are at now? Well, I, I can't say that we've added too much since that meeting. Um, uh, maybe you want to comment, but I'll, I'll just mention uh, at that meeting also, a developer presented a plan for adding eventually uh, some acreage that would be annexed into the city. It, right now, the, with the current plan, it has 24 lots for building. Uh, that came at a timely uh, moment there. To, uh, so we'll see how that develops. Um, but we're, we're, and obviously we have to go ahead with that community survey and uh, the, the completion of the uh, ongoing plan. You know, we, we have to keep looking ahead and, and get some facts and figures down. But we're kind of struggling, frankly, to to find exactly what our what our next steps are going to be. Uh, the city county planning board is not really designed uh, to develop housing. It's a it has a little broader purpose than that. So we may need to come up with another subcommittee or committee or board of some kind that can ride herd on this until we uh, actually get some houses up. I just, oh, go ahead, Tara. And I just add, like, um, I think this survey, so, like, I'm just thinking, like, everybody was concerned about housing before this. Now you did this survey. Now there's data. There's facts. It may, you know, it may not be perfect for everybody, but I'm just thinking if I was a developer thinking about, like, that developer that you just mentioned, Ross, like, now they have some, they have some data to go on. They have other data, too, that. Um, but this is helpful for them. That's going to help. They're going to take that to the bank for financing. I mean, this is like hard data that that is um, useful for people interested in this topic. Well, and in fact, it came out in our meeting that uh, they were planning a low density development. So just single family homes. But after hearing the presentation, they said, you know, we, we might rethink this. We might go to medium density so that we could put up a couple of fourplexes. So yeah. just. You know, just that kind of data for them was important. Yeah, and I just also, I just, I'm sorry, Katie, but I just, this is just so exciting. Like anybody can do this. Like this, you don't right. have to. Like you guys can share. You can Google housing survey, and you will find all kinds of survey options. Um, but it sounds like you're willing to share this. Maybe Katie, um, something that somebody can take this and just go around and do. We did this when I worked in Jefferson County. In Boulder, we we did this. We we focus. We did one survey focused on seniors, and then another just on the general public. But you have community volunteers that are invested in this solving this problem. They can go out and get the survey done, and you can yeah. get some, you're doing good answers. 
And it was very helpful to have a Ross with boots on the ground in Fort Benton. He did a lot of legwork to take it to the sheriff's office and to the hospital. We sent out emails as well, and he collected emails for me, and he's been really wonderful about pulling folks together, saying, okay, Katie, we'll come to Fort Benton this day. We have, we have a critical mass. Please come up. And so, you know, for those of you that are in varying stages of this, it's really important to have someone on the ground in the local community just very hyper focused on this and it's been a pleasure to work with him and his team. Um, they're a great group of folks that care deeply and they all come from very varying backgrounds. We've got some old um, retired builders, retired rancher. We just have people who've lived and had a um, long history in Fort Benton and uh, it is fun to watch them struggle a little bit. They've got um, differing opinions about what direction we go. We do have one realtor on the county planning committee that was um, noticing that there is things on realtor.com and on the market, but um, when you connect that with affordability, they might not necessarily be affordable. And that's kind of, you know, trying to make that link between, okay, that's great, you've got some supply, but, you know, what are you making as a first, second, third year teacher at um, the Fort Benton School District? And what are you making as a CNA or um, low level hospital worker? Um, is that going to support what is on the market? And then when it comes to rentals, that's a whole different ball game. So they are really seeing as many of our small communities are the issues with the short term rentals. So um, I'm more than happy to share the survey questions. I can share the results and then kind of the blank questions for you as well. And you're more than welcome to rinse and repeat. And uh, so, so um, just to reiterate, um, we've had a bunch of people join, so I'm going to share the recording and any kind of any presentation materials that I can, I'll share out. And so hopefully we can share a link or something, um, even the survey, whatever, whatever um, NeighborWorks is willing to share with us. We'll share that out. Um, and Katie, I'm presuming that. I mean, that's kind of why we're doing this. So, like, people know, like, oh, I can call Katie at NeighborWorks and she can help me with this. And so, so if you want to take this and go with this, you might be able to call NeighborWorks and just say, like, help us out with how would we do this? Or, and, you know, Extension can help you too, although we are not housing experts, but we are, we do know how to pull people together and help them work better together. So, yeah, I'll throw my email in the chat too, in case you want to reach out just directly um, outside of the, um, more mass follow up that Tara will do. And so it'll be fun to see what Fort Benton does next. Um, you know, they've, they've got some good groundwork. They've got some good plans. They've got some people in place. And so it's just taking the, those next steps after, after all of this. We have a couple minutes for questions. Does anybody have any other questions for the Fort Benton folks? Well, Ross and Katie, Katie, you're in, you're in down the road in building or great, in great falls. falls. Yeah. But Close enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have a, a question here. Interested in meeting with anyone in the Flathead Valley? We're in fundraising stages. Okay. For affordable. Okay. So maybe Flathead Valley folks, you can, uh, you can message directly. Nino and Victoria. Yeah, I would, I would uh, love to meet up with anybody that can give us some suggestions for concrete steps going forward or share some war stories that that would be good that's okay that's everybody keep that in mind because we want to talk about that at the very end oh like what so we've done these four webinar series now what now what next how can we help you next <clears throat> not seeing any specific questions i, I just kind of jumped in and took off that's great <laughs> Had these burning questions because I know like this is, you know, we I just heard from these folks around the state that are just like, hey, I'm not a housing person, but we want to hire some teachers here and we can't do it. So yeah, no, it's great. And just to reiterate, I mean, Katie is available to work with with you all if you have if you're interested in doing a survey, we have access to other survey tools. We can help you think through how to focus your questions in a way that's relevant to your community. Um, and the great presentation and summary work that Katie did as well. Okay, should we move on to Mar County, Tara? Okay, great. Definitely. So next we wanna hear from Mar County. They've been working for a couple of years on some needs assessment and building um, a coalition or a task force. And Jackson, I'm so glad to see you on. I didn't think you'd be able to join us, but great to have you here. And we also have Terry Taylor. So Jackson, do you wanna kick it off and two of you can introduce yourselves and 
tell everybody what you've been working on. Yes, happy to. Can you hear me okay? Great. Oh, yeah, I was, I, unexpe I had some unexpected found time that was related to the weather today, so I'm very excited to be able to jump on. Uh, and Terry is here as well, so I'll introduce myself and Terry, and then maybe we can just kind of tag team this and provide a little bit of info on what Mar County's been looking at, as Kay alluded to. Uh, so my name's Jackson Rose. I've been working with a grassroots group in Mar County for the last couple of years called the Mar County Stewardship Council. And housing's been one of the big issues that that group has tried to address. And I think White Sulphur Springs and Mark County, if you're not familiar, which I think most people are, it's, it's in central Monta Montana. It's very isolated. There's about 2,000 folks in the whole county. And I think it's like 2,400 square miles. So that gives you a, a sense of the population density. But like a lot of small towns, White Sulphur Springs is having issues with housing affordability and availability, specifically around workforce housing and teacher housing, similar challenges that we're seeing across the state. And so the Stewardship Council has kind of helped lead a number of efforts to start to address that. First, we partnered with HRDC out of Bozeman in 2021, and we did a housing needs assessment, which I'm sure a lot of folks on this call are familiar with that process. And that helped us quantify the existing need and potential future needs. Uh, and that's really where the rub comes in for Mar County is there's a potential large scale underground copper mine uh, that's in the permitting process, which would be located about 15 miles away from White Sulphur Springs. So that housing needs assessment that we conducted uh, just a short while ago estimated that the current needs somewhere between about 20 and 60 housing units that the community is short, and this is in a community of just a thousand, thousand people. So that's a significant need. Uh, but if if the mine was to move forward, that need jumps to somewhere in the range of 120 to 160. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty around the timeline with that project. But I think that's that's a very unique situation for for this rural community in that uh, there's a, there's certainly a need right now, but it could be much bigger uh, if certain things uh, proceed um, with the mine and and other developments in the county. So we, the Stewardship Council is curr currently partnering with local government to take that needs assessment and to take the, uh, the growth policies that exist. Uh, White Sulphur Springs and Mark County have partnered and they've made a consolidated uh, planning board that has uh, a growth policy with a number of goals. And so currently we're organizing an effort to take all this information and to come up with some real strategies to, to get units up, as I heard somebody say earlier, right? To find solutions that work and um, find pathways forward, which we think is gonna be a mix of, of public and private investment. A lot of the organizations on this call have programs uh, that can really benefit rural communities. So we're looking to take advantage of all the things and all the levers uh, to try to make this work for, for White Sulphur and Mar County. Um, and so uh, Terry, who's also on the call, representing Mark County, and I see a number of Mark County folks in the participants list, which is great. Uh, Terry is helping with this project as sort of a coordinator, and she also works part-time for HRDC. Um, so we're really grateful to have HRDC support uh, in Mark County. We're in their service area, which is lucky for us because they do great work. So that's kind of an overview of the way we're trying to tackle this. Um, and I I've really appreciated so far hearing how Fort Benton and how other communities are approaching this because I think we can all learn from each other, which is which is great. Um, Terry, so if there's anything you want to add or anything I missed, uh, feel free to jump in. And otherwise, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, I just wanted to add that I work for HRDC, as he said, and I'm just joining the stewardship committee. So this is like my first day. So I'm glad Jackson's here. Um, I also am a realtor up here. And I'm on the city county planning board and then I work for various ranchers up here. So I kind of have a full spectrum of life in White Sulphur Springs. Wonderful. Thank you, Jackson and Terry. If anyone has questions, you can see we did put a couple of links in the chat to the Mar County Stewardship Council website to the housing needs assessment that was completed. Jackson, I was hoping you would also be be willing to share sort of the summary document that is helping to coordinate this next round of task force engagement or um, uh, stewardship council engagement. 
because I think that that is a really lovely summary document that lays out what you're what you're hoping to accomplish and what some of your next steps are. Yes, I'd be happy to. I don't know if if Tara, if the best way to do that is for me to give that to you for the follow up email or perfect. Not, yeah, that'd be great, okay. Jackson. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, if you could, I'd like to get them out as soon as possible. So if you could send it, you know, as soon as you can, I would because I hope to get this out hopefully this afternoon if I can. We do have a question in the chat, which I I'm kind of curious too. Do you see any impacts from the music festival? Oh, that that is a good question. Um, you know, I don't I don't think there's necessarily any direct impacts from the music festival, but I do think that Mar County is a it's a tourist destination on some level, right? There's a lot of recreational activities in Mar County. Uh, there's Showdown, the ski resort. There's great you know, hunting, fishing, camping, all that kind of stuff. And the, the music festival is a real draw in the summer. Obviously that's become a very successful and popular event. If you haven't gone, put it on your list. It's a great time. Uh, but I, I do think that has led to some pressure with uh, there being a real incentive to have a short-term uh, Airbnb, VRBO style instead of a long-term rental. Uh, and we know that that's part of the picture. Um, you know, we try to make a real effort not to pin blame on folks that, you know, are looking to get another income stream by, you know, setting up an Airbnb. Um, but that is, you know, that is a factor in this discussion. There is there is some some incentive to have short term rentals, uh, which otherwise might be longer term community housing. So great. So I know there's been some fits and starts there in Mar County and you sound like you're on a really great path now and have some great next steps, but maybe share a little bit about how you got to this point, um, just the ups and downs, because I think some communities are maybe in one of those down points and needing to kind of maintain motivation and enthusiasm for how to get to a point where things can continue to move forward. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the Stewardship Council is a relatively new organization, uh, so Terry, maybe you can jump in on some of the longer term history. I don't, I don't have a long, long history in Mar County. Um, I do know that there has been kind of fits and starts, but um, I think taking advantage of um, when there are opportunities, when when there are developments or exciting new projects in the county. I mentioned. Uh, the mine, which is, is a controversial project, but it, it does provide the impetus and some of the urgency around the housing discussion, right? So I think uh, taking advantage of those opportunities when folks uh, have that heightened sense of, of urgency to address something like housing uh, is a great lesson that we've learned. We've really been able to, to use that as a launching point for this discussion. Um, Terry, anything to add on that front? No, I think that everybody is on the same page. I think that's been part of the problem is getting everybody on the same page. And you know how we all are, especially in this day and age, you want instant gratification and we need houses today and it's probably going to take years to accomplish it all. And then I think people might get frustrated, but um, I think they're coming around and it's every day at my HRDC, I deal with people just do not have anywhere to live. So I hope we can get something going here. Yeah, natural motivator seeing the seeing the need and um, being called to help fill that need. That's great. Any other questions for Jackson and Terry on the work in Mar County at this point? Okay, why don't we move on to Foresight? Yeah. Great. I just I just want to add so in our first webinar. So we have all of these four webinars, they are recorded and the recordings are posted on our webpage, which I will share. But in the first one, we talked with Park County and they shared their housing needs um, document, which is very similar. It looks a lot, I wonder if it's almost the same format that you have for the white sulfur one. And like what they did was they did it themselves they just did it themselves. They did the survey and they gathered the data themselves with the help of the extension office and some pretty savvy community volunteers. But um, that's something that you all can do as well. Um, you can also get help from NeighborWorks. Okay, next up we have um, Jennifer Anderson. Jennifer is my colleague. She works for extension. She is the uh, 
an extension agent working in Rosebud and Treasure Counties, and she's based out of Forsyth. And um, Jennifer kind of does everything in Forsyth. She's been there in extension for um, over 20 years, and she also now is on the school board. And they, as a new school board member, and they have a new, she's got a great story to tell about what they're doing with teacher housing in Forsyth. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Jennifer, and I'll load up your PowerPoint. Thanks, Tara. So I'm happy to be here and happy to share our story of where we're at so far. Um, just totally want to preface this with I am not um, by any stretch of the imagination a housing expert. And actually, even in this um, story I'm about to share, I'm kind of the secondhand um, participant in this. So um, <clears throat> just to give you a little, like Tara said, just to give you a little bit background information on myself. Um, so I'm an MSU extension agent for Rosebud and Treasure Counties. I've held this position for 25 years. Um, I actually have um, community development responsibilities in my job description, which is um, not the norm for uh, extension agents across the state. So I'm very fortunate to um, be able to actually sink my teeth into some community development projects and um, call it work. So. Um, as Tara said, I'm also a school board member. I'm in, I believe, my fifth year, so second year of my second term of being a school board member um, here in Forsyth. So if you're not familiar with Forsyth, um, Forsyth is the county seat of Rosebud County. Um, we're in the south, what, our southeast corner of the state, 100 miles um, east of Billings, 40 some miles west of Miles City. So right along that interstate there in between the two. Um, also home to, although um, close, we're also home to Coal Strip in Rosebud County, which um, is where the power plants are and um, has had a tremendous effect um, in our communities on multiple levels. Um, so also just to give you a little bit of background information about our school right now, our current enrollment is 296 K through 12. We are technically still class B. Um, however, we have 96 um, students in our high school and we'll be officially moving to class C next year, which is um, uh, necessary. Um, however, most definitely, I think there's a little bit of a grieving process with this um, of what was uh, to give you a little, a little bit more background information student wise. We have 296 students currently approximately 30 years ago. We were probably right around 600. So we're about half our enrollment of what we used to be if we went off of the numbers for graduating classes. Okay, um, so that's a little bit of background information about myself and Rosebud County and Forsyth where we're at. Um, Tara, if you wanna switch to the next slide, please. So um, how did we get to arrive at um, stu or teacher housing? Um, so it, I kind of call it the never ending story of teacher housing. Um, as I mentioned, I'm um, into my second term as the uh, being on the school board. And I'm now this chairman of the school board. Um, housing teacher housing had been on our radar for quite some time. Um, however, um, I think as teacher shortages um, hit home with us this past year, it became very apparent that we um, needed to address it sooner rather than later, um, as we were having teachers that at, we were hiring teachers that had no place to live. And what were we going to do? So um, it it became a kind of a general conversation to a uh, oh shoot we need to do something right away. Um, some other kind of factors that involved in this is that we had a changeover in our superintendent and we hired a new superintendent for this year. Um, the teacher shortage we recognized that need. Um, we also had because Tara had asked me one question like how did your board go in favor of this because um, we um, kind of jumped into the abyss which I'll share in a little bit but um, our board was super supportive of it. Um, we went from a very reactive approach to a very proactive report approach and we had board turnover and probably the nicest thing to say is um, change is good. So sometimes change is good. So um, how we started is we researched potential uh, potential opportunities for housing in Forsyth. So we actually had um, a couple, we have a couple plans in the works or at least what we were researching. And as we were having these ongoing conversations and researching different potential solutions, 
um, lo and behold, um, we had this blighted, um, what we call the drug house that sits straight across from our high school um, that became um, available um, from the county um, for an up for auction um, due to delinquent taxes. So that is a picture of the house that's in question. So um, Terry, you can turn it to the next slide. So here's some more pictures of the house that is in question. So um, the house became available for bid. Things started to happen very quickly. So we were, as a board, we were kind of talking and tossing out ideas and talking about different potential solutions. The house became available um, very quickly. It was a live auction. Very interesting. Had never participated in something like that. Um, so we, as a board, had to move very quickly to um, give approval to our superintendent um, to put a bid in on this house. Um, we did give approval for up to to spend up to twenty five thousand dollars. I think the final bid we ended up purchasing the house for twenty three thousand. I, I want to say. Um, so some lessons that we 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 really truly. Um, we were just kind of blissfully unaware and this kind of came up and so it required immediate action and we jumped in and we were naive and um, really honestly didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. Um, so the house that sits across from the high school, some lessons, some, uh, some roadblocks that came up right away and some lessons that we learned right away is um, prior to, as we were determining how much money we would um, uh, or what the maximum capacity we, we would allow the superintendent to put a bin in. Um, we went to the county and asked, can't you just gift us the school? Like, can't you just give the school the house? No, we learned that. No, we, we could not do that. Um, we were also researching some other addition or some other kind of blighted houses that were somewhat close to the school, but not directly. Um, like across the street. So what we learned very quickly is that we could purchase um, an adjacent property that was uh, adjacent to existing school property without going to uh, the people for a vote. So that made this piece of property ideal as well because we could go forth as the school board giving our superintendent permission and the um, approval to purchase the property without taking it to a vote, um, which we will talk, I'll talk about that a little bit later um, is also a lesson learned. Um, once we, so the auction, so it went to up to a public auction. Um, it was live bidding. We did have other bidders that were bidding against us. One was fully aware that we were there representing the school. Another one was not um, that, and they did bid us up on this. Um, and I, probably also to mention prior to that, we had reached out to some other local resources. I didn't put this in my list of resources, but we had reached out to a realtor. We had reached out to our appraiser, people that we knew that could kind of give us a rough idea of what the property was going to be worth. So we weren't um, you know, gonna spend a, a ton of money on something that we were, wasn't gonna be worth it. So um, we also did research those, uh, reach, sought that information out prior to actually going into the bidding process. So live auction, we end up purchasing the property, 23,000, I believe. Um, one other, the one gentleman bid us up, fully well knowing it was a school. Another one did not when he found out it was, we were there representing the school. Um, I think he was a little shocked. And I also think um, he was a little disturbed that the school was there bidding our property. So I will, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so once we got the property purchased, we were kind of blissfully unaware of what, um, again, what we needed to do. Um, very quickly, we went back to the county and asked the county and maybe the city, I'm not sure if our superintendent reached out to the city, but we definitely reached out to the county commissioners to see if the county could um, do provide some in-kind service of tearing down the house because the house needs to be torn down. It's not livable. We call it the drug house. I don't think drugs were ever made in the house, but there were definitely squatters staying in the house after all of the utilities were shut off and it's, it just, it needs to be torn down. Um, so what we found out very quickly is that the house most likely has asbestos in it. And because now it's school property, we had to call in the schools, um, 
I'm not exactly sure what the term of it is, but basically an asbestos specialist to come and um, go through the house and give us guidance because it's now school property. So naively, we thought we could just grab up some community members that had some equipment and we could go tear it down ourselves. No, you can't do that. So um, uh, now we were looking at the fact that there was going to be cost in tearing down the house and mitigation and holy smokes, we did not take that into consideration. And what do we do now? Um, so um, we reached out to, um, so first of all, we reached out to NeighborWorks right away through Terra to see what were some options and what are things that um, funding options and things like that, which we're still pursuing. Um, in the cleanup phase of things, once we found out that we could not just tear the house down or burn it down, which was what some folks wanted to do too, um, was we reached out to Montana DEQ and um, we also reached out to SEMDC, which is our Southeast Montana or Southeast Montana Development, um, which is our Regional Economic Development Council, who also has potential funding for um, cleanup, um, brownfield funding to help us clean up the property, which was our first um, uh, real positive response. So we reached out to a number of resources and um, did not kind of receive the news we wanted to um, until we found out, until we reached out to SEMDC and um, DEQ to see if there was some brownfield money to clean the house up, tear it down um, and remove it. Um, so we may have some funding for demolition and removal, which is pretty exciting to us because that's the first real like green light we've received after purchasing the house. Um, um, that yeah, that we've that we've come across. Um, let's see. Um, oh, architectural approval. So also in moving forward. So uh, obviously we need to tear the house down. We need to have that removed so that then we can figure out what kind of future housing we're going to put on this property. So in our, um, I know through my connections and Tara's connections with MSU, there is a MSU Community Design Center that is housed in the College of Architecture that I thought may be a potential resource because we have to have, again, because it's a school, we have to have uh, an architectural plan. Um, and I thought, we thought that we could reach out to the Design Center and that they could help us with that, um, which um, they could. Um, they were happy to um, visit with us and excited about it. However, once we researched this a little bit more, what we found out is that they would give us conceptual designs, but they could not give us the architectural designs that we needed to move forward, and they could not provide approval for it. And uh, none of the architects that we worked with were willing to touch it or put their sign off on it. So that was another dead end. Um, so we're learning a lot as we go through this. Um, Lots of interesting stuff. My role in this has really been kind of secondary, as I said from in the beginning. I, as the extension agent, um, true to light, I am more of a research person and a connector. So um, every time I come across a research uh, or research or come across a potential resource, my role has been to talk to our superintendent, and I've passed it on to our superintendent. Um, so I've passed it on to our superintendent and then he ends up doing a lot of the like work. Um, so I kind of feel like I am, I am at sometimes um, putting him on this wild goose chase. I come like, oh, hey, I found out about this research, this, this resource. And he goes and checks it out and comes back and is like, no, and here's why. Um, but these are all things that we have to do. So um some things that we're looking at right now um is if we can get the property torn down and taken out we're starting to research um what we could put in its place um, modular versus stick built um which our superintendent is visiting with a lot of uh, other school districts and it looks like they have uh, many of them have went the way of modular um saying that it is um, more economical um, and feasible that way. I don't know. We haven't reached that stage yet. Um, and we're also um, looking at different funding opportunities or sources of funding that we could use when we actually go to building, building or putting something in. We, our board just met um, last month at our board meeting in an update and we're shooting for the, um, um, not this upcoming school year, but the year after that, we're kind of hoping that we could have it in place by then. So um, 
that's a lot of, we've had a lot of discussion with our school attorney <laughs> through this as well. Um, I, I think he's probably been on speed dial because there's a lot of laws and, and things that we can do and things that we can't do. Um, so just, it's just been a fascinating pro, uh, process. Um, Tara is sharing the screen. So this is a, a Google Earth picture of our high school. So the property that the property that we purchased by the school is up there in the upper part. Um, that is the the outlined in red. And then um, I also am showing you our existing tennis court. So one of the approaches that we're potentially looking at um, when we just, you know, before this house became available, some of the other things that we're looking at and we are pursuing this one is that is our existing tennis court right now that sits next to our high school. Um, it was built on top of our old school that they didn't take the basement out and the foundation. So there is structural issues with this. There always has been, there always will be. So um, one of the things that we're doing is looking at, we are, um, looking at removing, taking out that tennis court and moving it um, to a different location, which I'll show you in a second, but um, that would free up this property for additional school housing um, in the long term. Um, so um, Tara is what Tara is showing us is the six picture. This is actually um, the lower one is our elementary school. The, the higher one up is our middle school. And then I've circled the tennis court. So this is actually old tennis courts on our middle school that have not been used in years. However, we've had folks come in and look at them and they're more structurally sound than the one at the high school. So we are pursuing a project right at right now to move the high school tennis courts over to the middle school and rehabbing these tennis courts. Um, so that will free up that piece of property if we want to look at that in the future. Um, and then, uh, another thing that was on the radar, another option that was on the radar from the beginning that we quickly realized was not going to be feasible because we would, it was just not going to be able to, um, will you go back to her for one really quick? It wasn't going to be, you know, it's okay. It wasn't going to be possible is um, where I put that potential housing site. That's just, a, that's just a vacant field. Um, so we were actually looking at what it would cost us to put in housing in the vacant field. And it was going to be astronomical. We just couldn't afford it because it has no utilities, no services, anything. It's just um, raw ground. Um, so we were looking at that and quickly realized that that was going to be too expensive. Um, we are moving. Hopefully, we've um, submitted um, working with SEMDC. have been a great partner to us. They have submitted a grant uh, on our behalf to the Montana Coal Board, which is a funding resource that we have available to us um, to move these tennis courts. Um, number one, because tennis courts we have now are unsafe, but number two, it also frees up that property um, over there by our high school to use for other other options. So um, that's just kind of a picture of what we're looking at. Some things that um, lessons learned as we continue down this process. Um, we um, I, This is a Dan Clark statement from MSU Extension Local Government Center, and he uses this all the time. He says investment follows vision, so you have to have a vision. And I think that that is one thing that we, um, our school board and our superintendent became very um, focused in on is that we have a vision for providing uh, teacher housing in the near future. And um, we're looking at all options and all resources to make that possible. Um, also needed to say that our, just like everybody else, our housing is, even though we are economically probably, um, and job wise, probably not where we were 30 years ago, um, due to railroad jobs, um, leaving and, um, what is happening in coal strip, um, the housing market has not really slowed down. I mean, it's, uh, had its lumps, but houses are, there's no houses available in Forsyth either. So, um, us going in and just buying a house somewhere probably wasn't going to be feasible either. So, um, pursuing teacher housing, some things that we've learned is you have to be innovative and flexible. You can get a plan, um, and I guarantee it'll change, um, because things you were, you're going to come up against some roadblocks that you had no idea that were there. Um, I would highly recommend that folks view their community through the lens of opportunity and assets and what you have available versus maybe what you're lacking and see the potential of things. 
um, because that's um, that's kind of what we had to do with the tennis court project and and the blighted house. Um, seek out resources, every resource that you can possibly imagine, and know going in, you're probably going to have a lot of dead ends. Like it's, you're just going to get your hopes up, you're going to get super excited, and then you're going to be bummed out. Um, but that's just kind of the nature of the process that you're on. Um, boy, howdy, I did not um, realize this, but you've got to be risk tolerant because we have jumped in. Um, we have jumped into something that we didn't know we were getting into, and it's kind of risky. Um, tell your story. So the reason why I'm saying tell your story, especially if you're a school, is that um, going back to the gentleman who bid against us, when he found out it was a school, he was just, um, he was shocked and a little disturbed um, because I don't, you want to get people on board. You want to build capacity. You want to seek out partnerships, anybody who can help you. And you've got to be able to communicate that to your greater community to share what this, what is happening in the story and your need um, to get them on board. Um, because if you don't, then there's just lots of um, gossip and negative comments and stories out there. Um, and then you're just going to be um, running around trying to put those fires out. So you want to get ahead of it and make sure that you're telling your story from the get go, um, which is something we probably haven't done a great job at, um, but we're, but we're working on. So um, that's a lot of, in a nutshell, where we're at. So we've bought a property, house needs to be torn down. We're looking for funding to tear the house down. At the same time, we're researching um, options, uh, teacher, ho teacher housing options to put in its place and also funding opportunities to pay for that. That's awesome, Jennifer. Thank you so much. It's such a great story. And I think that investment follows vision quote is it just it just is so true. Um, Okay, we've got a couple of questions. Have you considered Habitat for Humanity for this, for any kind of construction? No, we haven't. Um, and you said you checked with the fire department and they can't burn it down for you. No, okay. I don't think we, okay, so like, if, I don't know, it's probably about 10, 12 years ago, they was the last house they burnt down. I'm not sure they're supposed to do it anymore. So that's what we got told. So Jason Seiler can also suggest that Jason Seiler from Montana Department of Environmental Quality, and he presented last week on this very topic, cleaning up problem properties. So um, I'm going to share that link with you all. But if you are interested in this, just go watch that video because he really demystifies. And they have money now. They have money to help you. Okay, we have another question. Um, from Steve Zachman, he is from Baker, he's the mayor of Baker and he is awesome. Eastern Montana Economic Development Authority and Baker purchased half a block of blighted property a number of years ago following a survey of housing needs and community discussion on viability of new apartments and subsequent developed a triplex apartment on two lots. We later sold two lots to the Baker School District. They built teacher housing apartments. There you go. We may be a resource and I, and I do know that Baker has been on Jennifer's radar too. Yes, yeah, so so, remaining lots to individuals who built a seven plex. So there you go. So Baker is the one that our superintendent Baker and brought us, I believe, or two that our superintendent has been in contact with about how they did what they did and how they did theirs. So, yeah. And Marie Hirsch, she's an Arlie, and she said that um, that um, Jody Perez of Salish Kootenai did a couple of really great surveys. So that that's a great resource too. Um, any rural areas seeking investors, hedge funds, et cetera? Oh, anybody seeing investors, hedge funds, swooping in and buying properties? I haven't heard of that. Have you, Kaya or Katie? I've, we're seeing some in larger communities, not as much in rural areas, but I'd be interested if anyone is experiencing that. It's definitely a national trend that we are concerned about. Mm -hmm. Um, Larry Phillips is saying maybe using rural development mutual self help to build some homes on the vacant lots, assuming they're outside the edge of the city might be a good resource. So, we have a mutual self help program here in Red Lodge where I live. And then we also was, there was a mutual self help program in, uh, where I used to live in Whitehall and Boulder. And so that is. That's a time intensive program and you've got to have somebody that is can run it for you. 
I don't know. Which Nancy Jacobson just posted and said, that's me. So if oh, there you go. <laughs> in mutual self-help, Nancy Jacobson at our CAC um, is a great contact and she put her phone number there. Jennifer, I just wanted to say, I love your story. It's really inspiring. And I know that you're in the middle of it and feel like you maybe don't have a solution, but I think that the path that you're on is such a great example of what it takes to get a project to go. And it's not just, I mean, that's our experience at NeighborWorks Montana. When we work with the manufactured home community, we're trying to convert into a um, cooperative or we work with a multifamily building or we work, you know, this is a common experience. We're in the same position, trying to find every resource, trying to connect the dots, trying to get the financials to work. Um, so I think your story is really uh, applicable and, and relatable. Uh, thanks. I just, I want to say that I think um, with the, how, I, I think that our, the leader, our, our new superintendent is providing great leadership and uh, on moving forward. And I think he has full support of the board in pursuing this and the how the blighted house, it, something needed to be done. So at the very least, I think, even though we, even though there's a ton of unknowns and we just, you know, it's pretty risky at the same time, um, the house is going to go, like the house is going to get torn down. It is going to leave and it's not going to be an eyesore and nor is it going to be a, um, detriment next to our high school. So, I mean, at the end, like, yes, we're trying to clean up a blighted property and at the same time provide teacher housing. Um, you know, there's, there was a few years that was pretty shady. Uh, there was stuff going on there that shouldn't have been, and it was direct in direct view of our high school. So that in itself was a good move. Yeah. Okay, great initial outcome. Go ahead, Tara. Um, okay. So we're going to do a poll next. So get ready to answer a poll question. Um, but I just, this Chris is saying, I love all the creative solutions to rural housing that said they seem highly dependent on having the right folks in town. Yes, we have a problem with that because our small towns are dependent on leaders and go back to our 1st webinar or another webinar that we're, our leaders are really stretched in small towns. And so we have to provide what we can for them um, as far as resources and building capacity. Are there examples of regional or statewide efforts that can provide more coordination so places aren't left behind? And that is exactly why we have partnered with NeighborWorks Montana because they work across the state. Do you have any comments on this really astute observation? Yeah, that's so right. I mean, I think like you're hearing from all of these examples, there are statewide resources, regional resources, but they're not gonna be the first starting point. There, have, there has to be some local connection or local effort that can then draw on all of those resources and contacts. So hopefully you're seeing NeighborWorks Montana as that, the state, all of the great um, presenters and people who've been here who can share their story, share share what works, what doesn't. Um, there's, no, there's no magic silver bullet to any of it. It, it takes good coordination and collaboration across all those entities. So I put a poll up and I'm hoping that you all can um, answer this poll for us. It's uh, kind of, we're trying to understand where you're at, what stage are your, is your community at in this process of working on housing? Twenty so fifteen seconds left. I'm sorry, and maybe I started it too soon. Three seconds left. <laughs> okay. So, can you all see that? It looks like, yeah. Most people are. Let's see, are they just getting started? Yep. Yeah, just getting started or have started. We had about half of people respond to that 17. Do we want to do the second one now, Kaya? Sure, that'd be great. Okay. So we're going to get ready to see. Yes. Um, we're going to do another one, another poll here.
And this one you can answer um, more than one. You can answer as many as you want. So if you could just, um, cause this is gonna help us. The question is what would you be interested in to support your local efforts? So what kind of help do you need? So um, I'm gonna open this and we have a minute. So please let us know how, how we can be of help to you. This is gonna be really helpful for us to know what, what to provide to you all. Forty seconds left in the poll. You can answer. You can pick as many as you want. Theoretically, I guess. Hopefully, that worked. We can, um, yes, yes, five seconds left. So we'll, we'll send the recording out. We'll send all the resources that we shared out, hopefully this afternoon. And um, we, we're really kind of looking at what's next. So, Results for that. See that? Continued learning opportunities. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Great. Great. So from here, we were going to any, if we had any other questions, we have some resources to share with you. Um, very interested in next steps. Yeah, any other questions before we share some additional resources and next steps? Okay. So I wanted to mention again that NeighborWorks Montana and the state Montana housing put on an annual housing conference and this year it's going to be happening in Helena, May 15th through 17th. I'm going to put the conference link in the chat. I got it but, for you. I got oh, you it. do. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you, Jared. And registration will open um, in the next couple of weeks, early March. We do plan to have some sessions that I think will be relevant to rural communities. And if you're interested, we'd encourage you to attend. We do offer scholarships for people who aren't able to pay the um, registration fee, but it's a great place to connect with a lot of the people and resources that you've heard about over the last four webinars um, and just get a really good picture of what all is happening with housing and housing affordability and the, the projects and activities and solutions that are being um, implemented across the state. So love to have attendance from any of you there if you're available and interested. And then Tara, I think you had a couple other resources to share. Yeah, I mean, that housing webinar, we realized that you are going, or the housing conference, it might be something that you send somebody to Maybe you send one representative from your town to to attend. Um, cause that's why we're doing a lot of the work that we're doing with reimagining rules because working in rural communities are all volunteer and they can't always go to the conference, but something like this, you might really, um, it might pay off to send somebody there. Okay, so I've talked a lot about this um, webinar that we had last week, last Wednesday on rehabbing an old building. So this link will bring you there. Um, it's um, the link is right there um, on February 15th, and it was it was such a great presentation um, by Jason Seiler, who works at DEQ in Montana, and it just dem demystifies, you know, what we hear so often is people want to they see an old building and and they hear there's asbestos and it just stops activity in the tracks. So this is kind of really intended to demystify that and um, give you another person that you can call for help. And then Kathy Barda was awesome. They did such an amazing presentation and they they just, it was a one, two punch of like, here's the facts and here's how it played out in a real project in Lewistown. So that's a great um, resource there to, you can watch that um, 
And then there's there's this other initiative. It's an extension. It's it is more aimed at um, communities that are outside of a national park. But I think there's a lot of great resources here. Um, this is uh, um, lots of they have a toolkit. They have lots of webinars and um, materials that you can read on um, a lot of housing challenges because it's um, towns that are impacted outside of a state park from people moving in and Airbnbs and all of all of that stuff. So you can um, there's lots of resources there you can look at. So that's all I have for resources, Kaya. Yeah. So I think we will be regrouping Tara and Katie and I to talk about where we go from here, what resources we can provide and how this collaboration continues with the Reimagine Neighborhood and NeighborWorks Montana. Hopefully you all have our contact information at this point and you're seeing that if you have something that you're working on, um, both of our organizations can be a resource to help get you connected, get point you in the right direction, or even um, support some of the work on the ground. So it, I just want to say it's been such a pleasure doing this webinar with Tara at MSU Extension. It's been incredible to see the interest and the engagement from all of you. And um, clearly housing and housing affordability are issues that touch every part of our state, every community, and we really want to make sure that your communities are getting the support that you need um, and building on the incredible community assets and skills and strengths that you all bring. So excited to continue this work with you and just much appreciation and thanks to all of our panelists today. Thank you so much for sharing your work and your stories and good luck with um, what's next. We'll be excited to hear how everything continues to, to go. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone.